When I'm in the ranks, it's that time of the year when people are on vacation and gone. But we are glad that you are here. And we're glad that um, those that are away are listening online. We've got uh, somebody pass out these lessons for me, please. I got a little disclaimer on the printing. I'm still having a little bit of problem on my printer. I've got to go in and uh, work on my cartridge a little bit. That's what you get for buying cheap cartridges. Sometimes you got to put a little eraser on them and so forth. But uh, So bear with me there. Um, just bear with me just for a minute tonight, uh, this moment, but let's turn over to Daniel chapter seven. We'll be, and we'll look at verses nine and 10, and then we're going to go to Revelation chapter 20 verses four through six. And then we'll begin our, um, next to our last lesson. And we're talking about the founding and structure of the millennial kingdom Part two, I have kind of revamped this because I cannot cover everything I want to in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm going to cover what I want to cover in this two weeks. So you have to bear with me on that. Well, let me say this is um, prayer request wise. Of course, we need to pray for Tom Schinnebarger and uh, Carrie's husband um, physically and spiritually. And we... He's got a lot of problems. Of course, Carrie's had a lot on her plate. Was it a daughter that the, you know, the smoker blew up in her face? I, don't, I haven't heard anything about that anymore. Uh, also, uh, uh, my wife was talking to Robin Finland yesterday. And we really need to pray for Doug. Doug is really struggling physically, really struggling. And... Um, and, and so we'd ask you to pray for them as well. Um, help me out here. I've got a couple others. This has been a, a mixed week for me, a blessing and um, sadness. Um, a blessing to get up to see our kids and a blessing to reconnect with the folks at Central Baptist. I haven't been there in 11 years. And um, I was just... Uh, you're always a little nervous when you go back sometimes to certain places. And I was a little bit nervous, and God was very good. We had a good time. But uh, while we're there, we got our kids. We were able to get our grandkids into church. And uh, so pray that this will be a springboard. And Dave Johnson, who's uh, the song leader and one of the deacons, he's the largest dairy farmer in the UP, and uh, he and his brother. Um, said he'll set a cubby onto our family and work with them. Cubby is, his name is Lance, but he's always been called Cubby ever since this. I, now he's a dad with seven kids. And uh, so we had a good time and an encouraging time. But uh, I got word last night via Facebook that my good friend Dave Smith is dying from Lady Smith, Wisconsin. Um, I wish you would pray for the, uh, Elaine. Dave was a fellow pastor. I met Dave in 1987 when Pastor Taylor was in Ashland and we were in Wakefield. And Pastor Taylor wanted me to go to the Heart Conference, never been to one. This was that's when it was really small, about 40, 50 guys. And so my wife with two little ones and myself made our way over to Ashland going east or west. And she stayed there for a few days. And then Pastor Taylor and I dropped down to Hayward and picked up Day Smith. And we went to Heart Conference. And there we built, uh, built a relationship. But later when I went to Hillsdale, Wisconsin, Dave was in our Northwest Fellowship we became great friends. His son, Tim, is to my, my, this is my opinion, the best pioneer missionary ever. And uh, this, the young fella has more things to talk about. And he is with BIMI, where we sent the money for Ukraine. And he is now the representative of Central uh, Asia. But when we met him, he had graduated, he had gone to Russia to 
Um, he had gone to the north uh, up there at, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, north of northern Russia. And uh, we, we became close friends. Dave and Lane um, uh, moved from... Uh, moved from Hayward to Ladysmith, <laughs> fitting. But during their pastorate there, a tornado went through and destroyed their church. And the church was rebuilt, debt-free. People rallied around them. Uh, churches in Wisconsin rallied around them, and people rallied around them and rebuilt the church. And I've actually, but in between the time that uh, the tr church was destroyed and the new church was built, um, I've had, I, I went and preached for Dave a couple times while he was on vacation. Dear friend, dear brother, he and his wife, um, Lady Smith is one, I think it's Russ County, one of the poorest county in northern Wisconsin, if not the poorest county. And they worked a lot with the sheriff's department, and he was a chaplain. She did a lot of things with the community. They were well established, just down to earth people. But I wish you'd pray for Elaine. This is really hard on her. They've been married over 50 years, and Dave is a couple of years older than I am. The one thing that I am becoming ever more conscious of right now is the rest of life. We're getting, I mean, I'm, I know some of you are older than I am, but I look at it, I'm in my fourth quarter, actually, Every day is borrowed time for me. The Bible says 72 is six score and two is uh, uh, six score and ten rather, uh, and is the is the time of the 70, 72 right in there. And I I'm more conscious than ever about eternity. And so when we study this passage, is I look at. The blessed hope, and I'm not only going to heaven, but I look at the blessed hope as that we will be ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennial period. And that is something else to think about. Before we get started, let's pray. And uh, Brother Ricky, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about uh, this uh, founding and structure of the Millennial Kingdom Part 2. Next week we are going to deal with one section of this and then talk about the blessings in conclusion. We can't cover it all. As I was thinking and praying and, and meditating over this, I think this is apropos for the time that we live in with the political chaos that's going on in our country. Um, just unbelievable, isn't it? And um, just we see um, we see all of this going on, and I, I'll be honest with you, I just get sick of it, and I have to turn off the news, and it really it should drive us rather than to be centered on politics, really to be centered on what God has to say to us, Amen. And we have to continually look at that. And man's, man's quest is always to look for utopia. Everybody wants prosperity and peace, and everybody wants their piece of the pie, and everybody wants the American dream, everybody wants this, and they, you know, and so um, we get all these politicians that give us a lot of empty promises. 
And you know, I heard this a long time ago. You, you, you know when you know how, well, uh, when a politician is lying is when they open their mouth. <laughs> and that's really the truth a lot of times, when they open their mouth. And so everybody, they're promising the world, and when you get right down to it, they can't deliver that part. I, I'm here to say that that's, that's the way it's going to be until God's kingdom comes to this earth. And when that kingdom comes, everything that's promised will be delivered. Amen? Amen? Everything will be delivered. And so that should give us hope for the future. Now, let's turn over to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about some elements today uh, about leading up and then really uh, establishing of the millennial kingdom. We've seen verse 9 of chapter 7, I beheld till, till the thrones were cast down. Now, what are the thrones? These are all the earthly governments past, present, and immediate future. And, of course, when <clears throat> Brother Jeff went through the book of Revelation and when we went through the book of Daniel, we realized that there's these world powers that come and go. And, listen, there's going to come a time when the world powers are going to come to an end. All of this was, is going to come to an end. And that's really what we're looking for. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Where, where do you see that picture? You see it both in Revelation and Ezekiel, right? You see that picture? That's picturing God's throne, okay? A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000, 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Man, I tell you what, this goes right back to the book of Revelation, right? Goes right back to the book of Revelation. And someone says, you cannot understand the book of Revelation without understanding the book of Daniel. You just can't do it. I mean, this puts it in perspective. That's why the Old Testament and the New Testament really, um, they complement each other. They're not a separate dispensation like the amillennialist or postmillennialist believe that the Old Testament is Old Testament, New Testament, New Testament, and there's no connection. Folks, it, there's a definite connection between the two. Amen? Amen? Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 20. And, of course, we're talking about the millennial reign. And, of course, Jeff went, did, I still remember the, some of the things that Jeff went over when he went through this chapter. Very well done. And I want us to look verses 4 through 6 here. <coughs> and I saw thrones and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither uh, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Question, figurative or literal? Literal. literal. Amen. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Folks, it is a literal kingdom, and that's what we've been talking about. It, And so... We have been talking about this culminating factor. I mean, this is what this is what the scriptures, the central theme of the scripture is the kingdom of God. Now, you have three three parts to the kingdom of God. There there is what is called the universal kingdom, okay? The universal kingdom is where God rules all the time, all right? And then you have what is called um, the, the, the terrestrial kingdom or 
kingdom on this earth. And then there's going to be an ecclesial kingdom. And I can't get into it this morning. We often think of ecclesiastical speaking of the church, but it really talks about an arrangement of worship. And so when we see this kingdom that's going to come, um, there's going to be this arrangement of worship. Jeff touched on it. We'll touch on it a little bit next week. But the point is, our God is going to be here on this earth with us. And he's going to be ruling over us in the person of Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne of David. Now, that's very, very important. So we, 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 last week we uh, considered the establishment of the kingdom. We considered the fact that this is a future, future literal kingdom. The actual place of its central location will be Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world during this kingdom. Now, when you read the prophets and you read certain passages, you find out that God is going to level the mountains. He's going to level everything else. And everything else, physically, it's all going to point physically and spiritually to Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the crowning point of our, our king, the place where he resides, the place where he rules. Now, let me say this to you. This blows my mind. How this happens and how all the world, I mean, we'll still have countries. We'll still have, we'll still have nations during the millennium. Do you realize that? There will be the Jews, but there will be Gentile nations. We will see this next week. There, there, will, be, there will be this monarchical government. No legislation, no parties, no political parties. No bickering and saying, I want this piece. I mean, I, I, I just, when you think about what these politicians do, they all lobby for these pork things in their communities. What, how would our government run if, what efficiency would it have if they got rid of all that garbage? If they actually govern the way they're supposed to govern. Now, Jesus Christ is going to be a monarchical king. Now, he will have princes under him. And we will look at that. There are going to be three groups that are going to be those that rule and reign with him. And by the way, you're one of those groups. The church is one of those groups. And so we have a position in the kingdom. And I've already staked mine. I, was, I want the UP. I don't care if it's a small county. I just want that part of the world, okay? I'm just being facetious there, but you know what I'm talking about. So when we think about this, Jerusalem will be the capital city from where the great king will govern the whole world. He is a real king, and he will sit on a material throne. Now, there are people today that would think, would like you to believe that this kingdom of Jesus Christ and this spiritual kingdom is just a aretheal or a gaseous kingdom. We're just part of it now. There's nothing going to be happening on earth. There's no hope for anything on this earth. It's just that we're going to, we're going to live, kind of get through life and then get on to eternity. And really, that's the amillennial and postmillennial viewpoint. The reason they don't view the kingdom as literal, part of it, and there are several reasons, and we're not going to rehearse that and go through that and rehash that again, but part of it, they believe that it will be too materialistic, that there's all this materialistic outlook in the kingdom. Very interesting to me because... Um, and if you were to if you were to if you were to follow covenant theology, now know of a church where the next pastor who was a 
didn't let the church know, but he was covenant in thinking. And he went to this church, and the first thing he did is he got everything out of the front of the auditorium. No American flag. He moved it out to the foyer. He didn't want that there. He didn't want anything. And so you go to some of the Reformed churches, and they have nothing on the platform because they say, this, we're not of this world. Our kingdom is in heaven. We're not here. So you have all this convoluted ideas uh, and really where the anti-Semitic um, thought comes from, God's done with Israel. And I can see this even in reflections on Facebook. Some of my friends are kind of covenant and they are downing Israel with this war. Christians. And I can understand from a human standpoint from a human standpoint this is very atrocious to them that Israel is going into the West Bank and all these people are being displaced and killed I heard this from a marine uh, uh, guy for, that was in the Marines and um, he was a missionary at one time he was a missionary by the way it's interesting to me how many Times God calls missionaries out of the service, our services. You, you, you ever notice that? A lot of a lot of men that serve in the service go to a foreign country and they get a burden for it. But he made this statement, and I've mulled that over. He said, "War is really the consequence of sin. War is the consequence. It's the punishment of sin." So you, 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 I mean, so we can get off to some wild things, but I, and I say this sincerely, and I know people boohoo this, but I believe this is why Haiti gets so hammered. Why? He, he, that's a center of witchcraft down there in Haiti. So it is almost Satan's seat there, okay? So th th thought there anyway. Well, let's get back to our thought here, okay? So... We see this, that this kingdom will be a revival and continuation of the historical Davidic kingdom. Now, let me say this. We were able to talk about God's earthly Old Testament mediatorial kingdom. And this is a great part of understanding, really, the, the millennial kingdom. Because God had intent to make Israel this special nation to be the banner of his glory. In fact, in the Old Testament, the, really the, the command was to come. Come to Jerusalem. Come to God's people. Come to their, to their Savior. And you know, it's kind of different in the New Testament when we get into the church aid. What does he say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's different. But God had intended for Israel to be his earthly kingdom in the Old Testament. And from there, the nations of the world would be blessed. However, what happened? They failed. Just like, just like the creation edict, edict when Adam and Eve were to subdue the earth and rule over it, what happened? It failed. So what does God do? Does God wring his hands? No, he's got this plan all set in stone that there's this coming kingdom. Thank God we're going to be part of a literal kingdom. And part of it, okay, and the central part of it is God's fulfillment, and we didn't have time to go over this either, and that's God's fulfillment of all the unconditional covenants that he has with Israel. Uh, can you name the unconditional covenants that God had with Israel? Just help me out here. What would be the first one? Pastor's been going over some of this on Sunday night. The Abrahamic covenant, right? Is that not a unconditional covenant? There is also the, what is called the Palestinian land covenant. 
God had promised them a land. What is another one? The Davidic covenant. That God's throne would never leave. I mean, the throne, David's throne would always, somebody would occupy David's throne. And if you get back in the Psalms, David recognized God's son coming to take his throne. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. And then we have another covenant that often we claim as our own, but it is not for us. What is that covenant? The new covenant. And that's found over in the book of Jeremiah. The new covenant is not for the church. It is for Israel. And the covenant is that one day they will all turn to him and be saved. They will serve him from the heart. When will that take place? When Christ comes down to this earth. Now the question is, what do we have to do with the new covenant? And as I, like one author said, we enter into the blessings, the spiritual blessings of that new covenant. Aren't you glad of that? I mean, Paul talks about it. We are grafted in. The Gentiles are grafted in. When Before Christ, we had nothing. Ephesians tells us that. We're nothing until Christ came to the cross and we become part of his plan in the church. I'm glad of that, aren't you? I mean, did Gentiles get saved in the Old Testament? Yes. But was Israel was the central, central part of that, okay? So now let's go on. We briefly considered the ruler himself. The mediatorial king is central to the description of the kingdom. Now, let's turn over to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. This is a key passage of scripture in the Old Testament that we often think about when? Christmas, right? But this is, has a dual, really, prophecy to it. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That is his first coming. Amen? That is what we, why we celebrate Christmas, is because that's his first coming. He comes as a babe. He comes as a human being. But notice this. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it, with judgment and with justice from henceforth forevermore the zeal of the Lord will perform this. So we have not only the picture of the first coming here, but we have a picture of the second coming when Christ comes to establish his kingdom. So when we think about him, and I didn't put this in here when we talk about the identity of this mediatorial king, there's an enigma, and I see if I can find the passage here real quick. Let's turn over to Zechariah. I think I can, maybe, maybe not. Uh, let, me, let me just check real quick here. Zechariah 14. Maybe I can. Maybe it's 9. And I should have wrote, written this down. 14.9. He probably is, brother. Okay. Okay, yes. And the Lord shall be king over the earth in that day. Shall there be a Lord in name one. But there is also a passage in here too that talks about the fact that he was, <clears throat> that he was first a babe or that he was a shepherd and lowly. Okay, and that might have been in chapter 9 or chapter 4. I can't remember it. So I'm not going to try to find it right now. 
But here's the great enigma or the great mystery. This is what blew the Jews' mind is that when Jesus came the first time, he came lowly and is a servant, right? And what were they looking for? They were looking for somebody to displace Rome and to set up his kingdom right then. They wanted somebody that was militant and that had the authority and power. And so when, when he was crucified, 1 Corinthians says the preaching of the cross is what? Foolishness to the Jew. That word foolishness is the word where we get moronic from. They thought it was stupid. It is the idea of like this enigma, fried ice. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, right? This did not make sense to them. This spoke of weakness. This spoke of, that's not the Messiah they were looking for. But he came the first time as the lamb. You realize that a lamb is very, very docile, right? But this lamb came to be slain the first time. But the next time he comes, he will be the lion of Judah. He will be the king of kings. It will come with great authority. He will come with great power. He will come to make war. And we were talking about that last week. He will come. It's a different thing. And so there's this enigma. They can't comprehend that. By the way, when you think about it, that's how people look at it today. For, to the world, the cross is foolishness. But Paul said in Romans 1.16, it is the power of God. Amen? I want to tell you something. The greatest thing in the world is when you see somebody come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Especially someone that you would never expect to do that, right? I mean, I look around here. Every one of you, I mean, especially those that have maybe have a Catholic background or a background that uh, you had a rough life and stuff. And you say, well, I'm the most unlikely candidate. Aren't you glad that Paul said this in Timothy? He said, I am thankful for the Lord. I'm the chiefest of sinners, but he saved me. Aren't you glad of that? I am so thankful for that. So when we look at this, we, 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 we look at this idea of the Messiah. Uh, in the Old Testament, they couldn't comprehend that because the Jews couldn't comprehend that because they wanted an immediate they want immediate results. <clears throat> it was not God's plan. It wasn't his purpose. Folks, when he comes, he'll put, and we'll talk about it more in a little while, his character is unsullied. There is no problem of doing a background check on him. Right? He's the God of this universe. So let's go on here, okay? The nature of his coming king. And uh, you can look up all these verses that I put down here. I put them down there so you could study it. He is truly human king, reflected in titles given to him. Isaiah sees him as a man reigning in righteousness in Isaiah chapter 32. In uh, in Isaiah, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, he describes the king's appearance as like unto the son of man. By the way, that's one of the greatest terms that Jesus has been given, the son of man. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, right? Both Old Testament and New Testament, you see that phrase. <coughs> Reflected in his experience, which are common to mankind... And our particular outline in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Let's turn over to Psalm, Isaiah 53 just for a minute. We got time. Isaiah 53. Um, one of the, to me, this is called the John chapter 3 of the Old Testament, okay? I mean, we often hear about people that said, well, I'm a nobody. And we hear people that say, you know, I, I, I'm just, I, I have nothing. Look at the description 
of Christ here. Verse 1 of 53, who believed our report to whom the arm of the Lord revealed? For he should grow up before him as a tender plant and his root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness. Think about that. He's not what we call, we usually think of somebody that's great physique and everything. It's not, that's what is centered on. Notice this. And when we shall see him, there's new beauty that we should desire him. I don't know what Christ looks like. Now we have portraits. We have the Solomon's head of Christ. I mean, if you were to go down uh, I-75, Dixie Baptist Church, Dr. Paul Vanneman put up years and years ago the Solomon's head of Christ. You ever seen that archway down there? And uh, when you think about it, that is just unbelievable. But we have no idea what he looks like. But here's this. He is despised and rejected of men. Question, have you ever been despised and rejected? Have you ever felt downcast, didn't fit? I think sometimes all of us feel that way in certain situations, right? Do we not? And then it says, he's, he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We talk about low esteem. Christ could have had low esteem, right? Think about that. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we didn't esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone in his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened on his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers, a dumb, as dumb, in, excuse me, as is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And then you go down through there. And verse 12 talks about this future kingdom. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he is numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor. Listen to me. Christ came as our sacrifice. He's going to come as our sovereign now. He came as a servant. He comes as a sovereign. That's what Philippians chapter 2 talks about. Okay, so we go on. And yet, yeah, but he's more than human. He is truly divine. We see this in Isaiah 7, 14. If you uh, got, turn over to Isaiah 7, 14, another, another one that we use at Christmas. Therefore, the Lord shall, himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name what? Emmanuel, where do you find that at? Matthew 123. And what does it mean? God with us. Aren't you glad of that? God with us. He's incarnate, God incarnate. We just read it in Isaiah 9 6. The prophet crowns him with a aggregate of titles, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And he's called in Zephaniah, the king of Israel, even Jehovah. Zechariah, in his magnificent description of the mediatorial kingdom as it concerns the nations, or affirms that these nations will come up to Jerusalem to worship the king whose name is Jehovah of hosts. We see that in Zechariah 14, 16 through 17. By the way, that's part of what we're going to be looking at just briefly at the beginning of our lesson next week the constitutive um, inauguration of the kingdom. Let me just stop here in case we don't get to it because 
There are four things that I want to point out. The fourth one we'll deal with next week. But when Christ comes to set up his kingdom, it's going to take a little time to set up his kingdom, right? Do you believe that? Yeah. How do we know that? Turn over to Daniel chapter 12. Let's do this real quick in case I don't get to it because we'll be looking at this aspect <coughs> next week about the setting up the kingdom, the blessings of the kingdom. Let's turn over to the book of Daniel again. In, um, I believe it's chapter 12 here, okay. Okay, notice this, Daniel chapter 12, let's look at the last 11 and 12, okay? <clears throat> and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,000 or 1,290 days. And blessed is he that cometh, waiteth to, and cometh to the thousand. 305 and 30 days. Question, when we look at the tribulation period, what did we say the tribulation period is divided into? Two, three and a half year periods. And Jewish calendar, 360 days, okay? So what do you have here? You have the first half is 1260 days, but when he comes, it's 1260 days. But then it talks about from 1260 to 1335, there's something that happens here. There's another 75 days. This is where dispensationalists believe all the things that we're going to be discussing at the beginning of our lesson next week will take place. I mean, what, what has to happen when he comes to this earth? Well, there's going to be judgments, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But there's going to be judgments. Uh, there's... He's got to set up the kingdom, put people in place, different things. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Okay, let's go on. The origin of the coming ruler, he is from heaven. He is God's servant from heaven. And so we see this throughout the book of Psalms. We see this throughout Micah, Zechariah, Malachi, and 1 Corinthians 15, 47. You know... <clears throat> As pastor's been going through 1 Corinthians, and, and when he went through 1 Corinthians, and um, now he's going through the book of Hebrews, as I've been studying this, I see how all of this dovetails with those passages. And you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we look at it as the resurrection chapter. It's much more than the resurrection chapter. It has a lot of deep doctrine about future events. It has what's going to happen in the future. And we talked about that a little bit. So the character of the coming ruler. Now this is what we need to come to. He is righteous and faithful. That's what Isaiah 11, 5. I wish we could find a politician that was right and faithful. Amen? Think about that. Is there any politician that's righteous and faithful? None. I don't care if they're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, or yellow, blue, green, whatever. None of them are completely faithful and righteous. I mean, I just, I told my wife, I said, this truly, and I say this sincerely, the politics of this country is truly a cesspool. <coughs> I don't matter how you cut it, it's a cesspool. And we've lost our values. We've lost our moral compass in this country. And there's none, and I say this sincerely, there's none that are right and faithful. Sad, isn't it? He is holy. Isaiah 12, 6. One of my favorite hymns, that Northland used to sing, as holy as he. You ever heard of that song? Holy as he. That's a beautiful song. He is holy. He has clean hands, pure heart, and never sworn deceitfully. Just when you think you got the right man, 
What happens? You find skeletons in their closet, right? You won't find skeletons in our Savior's closet. Aren't you glad of that? There will be no skeletons whatsoever be brought out because he has clean hands. He's, he's been, he is pure heart and they're never sworn deceitfully. The ability of the coming ruler, he will not fail. Let's turn over there. That I, 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 I'm going to tell you something. How many times have people failed us? How many times have people failed us? I had a deacon. Now I'm being facetious. But he came to me and said, Pastor. And he, this is, he actually came to me. His name, name was Mike Foster. And, and, and Mike Foster said this to me. He said, Pastor, when you die, we deacons want to be your pallbearers. I said, what? Yeah, I said, we want to let you down one more time. <laughs> I said, Michael Foster, shave by you. I mean, we had good deacons, and we have good deacons here. But let me say this. We all fail, don't we? We all fail, but he will never fail. Isaiah 42, 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. By the way, the cry of every Israelite, the cry of those that long for the kingdom, if you study the book of Isaiah, Isaiah's cry is how long? How long? And you know, our cry is how long? When, when is the rapture coming for the church, right? But for the Jew, how long before the kingdom is going to be restored? How long? Will everything be set right in this world? He's righteous. Okay, he, the ability of this rule, on one hand, he is great knowledge, Understanding wisdom, counsel, and the fear of Jehovah, not judging after the sight of eyes, nor making decisions after the heart, hearing of ears. Let's turn over to Isaiah, being more great in Isaiah. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 11. <coughs> and here's, here's almost the same thinking here. And as Isaiah 53, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And let me ask you this question. We would just like to see something right today, amen? We'd just like to see what is right. I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't, See what is right, and I, we we all have our presuppositions, or we we all have our opinions. But wouldn't it be great to have somebody that could stand up and say, "No, here's what's right, and here's what's wrong. Live with it." He will be a perfect ruler. One hand, he will rule with a rod of iron. But he has this balance in him that he has tender compassion. And he will, he, you talk about real social justice. This will be real social justice in the millennial reign. Aren't you glad of that? Now, let's go on. As his ability and power, Isaiah pictures him in a figure as foundation of stone, which is tried, precious, and sure. 
there would be no compromise between what ought to be done and what can be done. You know, we hear this word compromise. Well, we got to compromise. What happens when you compromise? You always what? Lose something, right? Something, you always lose something. You never gain anything. You always lose something. And the fact is, Christ will say this is yea or nay, and that's the way it will be. The functions of the coming ruler, he will, uh, he will uh, fill all three functions of leadership that was found in the historical kingdom of Israel, which were the prophet, priest, and king. And he will, he will fulfill all of those offices in that coming kingdom. Now, we went over that a little bit, but I'm not going to take much time because I've got to get through the rest of it. But think about this. <coughs> the prophet, we talked about what the role of the prophet was in the kingdom. We talked about what the role of the king and what the role of the priest. Christ will fulfill all of those in this coming kingdom. Now, the establishment of the prophetic kingdom in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it is immense, and I mean it's complex, in virtually impossible to cover in the time that's allotted to us. I mean, we would be here weeks, but I'm going to follow a little outline that Alan McLean gave, and I thought this was really good outline. How many of you remember the statement, the day of the Lord in the Bible? The day of the Lord, okay? The day of the Lord is found 29 times in the Old and New Testament. 28 of those times has to do with this coming kingdom. The 29th time found in Peter has to do after the kingdom and the day of the Lord when this earth will melt and the new heavens and new earth will come about. <clears throat> it, is, it is talking about God's day when he sets everything aright. We live now in the times of the Gentiles. We live now where it seems like God is not near sometimes. He is. He's ruling over his universal kingdom. But one day, he's going to rule over this earth, from earth. And we call this, when God intervenes, the day of the Lord. I mean, it seems like Satan is having his heyday now. But it's like the old adage, you know. What's the score at the top of the first inning? Well, they got 15 runs on us. Well, wait till the bottom half of the inning, okay, when we can put up more runs than they have, right? And that's what's going to happen when God intervenes in this world. Now, there's four components of the, when we talk about the day of the Lord. There's four, uh, really four divisions of this, and that's what we're going to center around three of them this morning in the last 10 minutes. First of all, there's the connection of the day of the Lord. It's a picture, a period, which is always associated with the kingdom of Old Testament prophecy. And, and it, 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 although it's a period of unrevealed and definite length, but the descriptions of its general character suggest that the prophets may have in mind a form somewhat parallel to the Jewish calendar. The, the latter was solar, which begins at sunset. If, if you were to look at a Jewish day, when does it begin? Now, when, when, we, when do we begin our day? In the morning, right? Jewish calendar, Jewish people didn't do it. The Jewish day, according to Leviticus, they, they started their day at sundown to the next night, sundown. And extended, the latter was a solar which begins at sunset and extended to the next sunset, consisting of a period of darkness followed by a period of light. By the way, I think that was alluded to when, when you read some of these passages. I think Jeff read this passage. Uh, that uh, in Psalms where it says there is weeping in the night and joy in the morning, right? And that's the picture here, okay? So, it, it is this consisting of period of darkness followed by a period of light. The composition of the day of the Lord then is in similar fashion, the great day of the Lord is pictured as a period of both darkness and light 
the sequence of is the same. First darkness, then light. And <coughs> folks, here it is. No Isaiah 62. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and the glory shall be seen upon thee. I want to ask you something. When you when we went through the book of Revelation, when Jeff went through the book of Revelation, was those dark days. It got darker and darker and darker and darker until it was the deepest darkness yet you can imagine, right? But what came the day of the Lord and light came, okay? Get the picture? Furthermore, um, always begins with darkness of divine wrath and then moves to the light of divine blessing. Furthermore, the twofold division of the day, Lord, the prophets added the third category, namely those events which takes place before the great day. We see that. Finally, there are four important events which seem to take place right at the dawning period between the darkness and the light. And so here we have these four divisions. Number one, there's the preparatory events. And I'm just going to go over them lightly here this morning. I got five minutes to do it. First of all, there, and I won't read all of this. We won't go through all of this. But there is this judgment that is set in heaven. God is poised right now to bring judgment on this earth in his time. Do you believe that? And so it says in verse Daniel 7, 10, a fire stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands, men are down, 10,000, 10,000 stood before him. The, the, the word here in the Hebrew would be myriads. It's myriads and uncountless angels. Where do, where do we see that same terminology? We see that in the book of Jude. Same terminology. When Enoch said the Lord is going to bring thousands and myriads coming back with him. This is judicial activities that take place in, in, in heaven, not on earth. It's not like God is up there. Uh, what are we going to do with this ragtag group down here? God is poised to bring judgment. He's poised. It's, he hasn't fallen asleep. He's not asleep at the wheel. He doesn't wring his hands, but he's poised. Secondly, we talk about the penal events during the darkness of the day of the Lord. And what is that? That's what Jeff went over from Revelation chapter 6 through verse 19. The punishments, it is meted out. And I, God meets out this punishment step by step. You ever notice this in the book of Revelation? What, one thing that always stands out to me when I read the Revelation is the patience of God. He's long-suffering. He gives time after time after time for people to repent, and they still won't do it. And then thirdly, there's this transitional events at the dawn of the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, the glorious arrival of the king says this, and it shall be said that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I mean, we, we talk about this, the doom of Antichrist and Satan brings hope and light. And next week, you can read all the, ins and outs here. I, I don't have time to go into specifics. Last of all, which will we look at next week and we will look at also the blessing. And <clears throat> Alvin McLean calls it the constitutive. And I had to look it up to know what constitutive means. It means fundamental. Events during the light of the day of the Lord. Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of God, Lord has risen upon thee. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall any moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning will be ended. Aren't you glad of that? When his kingdom comes, there will be no more tears. There will be no more sorrow. 
And so when we talk about this constitutive time, and we'll talk more about it this week, what happens in those 75 days? He will, he will, um, he will, um, he bring, which he will, uh, I can't, on humanity, separate the righteous from the unrighteous, erect an organization of the government, make right the things which are wrong. In short, the king will do the things necessary to bring the wondrous benefits and conditions of a long awaited kingdom. And so we're going to look at those progression. What does he do? We believe in those 75 days. There are certain things that he does to establish and sets up this kingdom which results in great blessing. And that's what we got to realize. It's going to be a blessed time. Oh, man. Aren't you glad of that? Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, we pray that you would be with us this morning's service. Be with our pastor as he brings the word of God to us. Help us, Lord, to really, again, think of the future. Now, Father, we, we, we realize that we, as B.R. Lichen said, we have to live in the nasty now now. But, Lord, we need to be also focused on the sweet by and by when you come to this earth and when you reign and rule. Lord, what a day that will be. When our Savior we shall see, not only in heaven, but we shall come with him to make everything right on this earth and to see the Shekinah glory of God manifested in this earth totally from one end of this world to the other. Lord, what a glorious day that will be. Now be with us this morning, I pray in your name. Amen.